your wedding questions answered. That's coming up on an all new episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. Hey there, it's Cara, and the goal of our time here together on the Wedding Planning Podcast is pretty simple. I want you to have all the resources and the confidence to plan the wedding that you want, minus the crushing stress, expense, and overwhelm felt by so many engaged couples. If you're newly engaged and looking to kick off the new year with a fresh start on your wedding plans, then be sure to follow the show wherever you listen for a brand new episode delivered straight to you every Wednesday. And please feel free to share with your friends and family as well. These episodes are really helpful for everyone in your life who's helping you plan the details of your dream wedding celebration. To be in touch with your wedding questions, browse past episodes, and special offers from our sponsors, visit our website, weddingplanningpodcast.co. Enjoy the show. Hello there. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And if you are newly engaged since the holiday season and everything, this is a very popular time. A huge congratulations to you and your fiance, and again, thanks for letting me be a part of your wedding planning journey. That's a huge honor, and I do not take it lightly. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy New Year. I hope you had a wonderful holiday season with your families and your friends and all of your loved ones, and I hope you are fired up and excited for a wonderful 2024 as I know I am. I thought it would be fun to kick off our new year with a wedding Q&A show. I love doing these shows as a quick aside, and they are only made possible by your questions. So as I mentioned in the intro to today's show, if you have any wedding planning questions, whether that be about logistics or something that has been puzzling you or has you stumped or you want some creative suggestions. Again, I really, really do love to hear from you. I personally got married a really long time ago, so I don't do this show for me. I do this show for you. And what makes it more valuable than exactly what's on your mind and exactly what you are wanting? So please do not be shy. I am a quick email or voicemail away. I do not have to use your voice on the show. I don't have to use your name on the show, as you'll see in these questions today. I paraphrase a lot. It's completely anonymous. I'm here for you, so please take advantage. And you can find the contact form to, again, shoot me an email or leave me a voicemail. That's on the website, which is weddingplanningpodcast.co slash contact. And with that, let's jump in with our first question about choosing our wedding date. This couple is getting married in 2025, so a year and change away from now if you're listening to this live, and they are torn between the day after Valentine's Day or fast forward a couple of months, having a wedding in April of 2025. And then the background and the conundrum here is that the very best friend of the bride cannot be there the day after Valentine's Day. However, that is the couple's preferred date to get married on February 15th. So the question is, should we stick with the date we really want to get married, even though my best friend cannot be there on that date? Or should we get married in April? And here's the kicker. The best friend, quote, might be able to be there in April, but they're not absolutely sure about that either. Okay, (laughs) this is a hard decision that you're going to have to make. Choosing a wedding date can be tricky enough for everyone. I think we all experience a little bit of struggle there. And in my experience, having seen literally thousands of couples go through this process and get married, I can say that choosing a wedding date that works for literally every single person is probably going to be impossible. Maybe not. Maybe not, but it's probably going to be difficult to accommodate every single person. So just 
know that, and that can be of solace. Now, the hard part here for this listener is that it's her best friend. It's like her potential maid of honor. It's her very closest friend in the entire world who cannot be there for sure on one day and who might be able to be there on the other day. So if it weren't for that might be able to be their part, I would say, yes, I would lean towards sacrificing the day you truly want in exchange for having one of the most important people in your life be there with you. But the might part, the the part where she might not even be able to make the second choice date, that kind of changes it for me personally and makes me lean towards the two of you choosing the date that you truly want and going ahead with that. It's a crummy situation all in all, top to bottom. There's nothing easy about it. But the lack of commitment for even the second choice date, again, that kind of tips it for me. So I hope that was helpful. And then getting into the next question, this one is about guest list and who to invite. If you missed last week's episode, please go back and have a listen to that one. It's all about creating your guest list. And I walk you through, I don't know, eight or so really easy kind of checkpoints and steps in order to get your final guest list, which much like choosing your date, that can be a very tricky process. There are landmines everywhere with who should we invite, who should we not invite, Are we going to hurt people's feelings, et cetera, et cetera. So go back and have a listen to last week's show if you missed it. That's dated January 3rd. And then with regards to guest list, here is this question. And I'm going to paraphrase the situation a bit. This couple met via their church youth ministry, and they've been involved as volunteers since they met and started dating. So their relationship has really evolved in the space of this volunteer work with the youth ministry. They are inviting everyone from the youth ministry. So that's kids and parents as well. And they're all being invited to the ceremony because Again, they've been an instrumental part of the relationship, and there's plenty of room at the church to accommodate everyone. So it's meaningful to them that all these people from the youth ministry are there. To keep costs down at our reception, we are not inviting anyone under the age of 21 who is not a first cousin. This means that none of the kids from the youth ministry would be invited. Okay, that's easy. The hard part is that some of the parents of those kids have been really good friends and mentors to us over the past couple of years. However, we're not close with all the parents, only some. Those who we are not close with, we don't particularly want to invite to the reception, but we don't want to burn them by inviting some of the parents, but not others. Thank you so much for being in touch with this question and not an easy answer here. Again, none of these really are. Well, some of them are, but for the most part, we're dealing with a gray area, right? There's not a yes or a no or a black or a white. It's all kind of nuanced and depends on so many different variables. So let's talk this through. When we're dealing with groups or segments of our relationships, I generally recommend taking an all or no one approach. So for example, some popular categories in your guest list as you start to kind of compile names would be family, co-workers, neighbors, college friends, high school friends. And when I say all or no one, For example, with coworkers, again, this depends on your situation, but if you have a group of six coworkers and you're close with them, of course you are. You spend 40 plus hours a week with these people. You talk to them every single day. Maybe you go out for drinks and you socialize outside of work, but would you actually feel comfortable only inviting two of those coworkers and not the other four? knowing that the week after the wedding, all six of you are going to be back in the office and the four who didn't get invited know that the other two did. 
in most cases, it just creates kind of an awkward situation. Maybe not in yours, but in most cases, it does. So the all or nothing here with this question, I my my instinct tells me unless you're inviting all of those parents, I would say you invite none. And just sit with that talk it through with your fiance. And if you have a nagging feeling in your heart that, look, there really are two or three sets of parents who have been really close with you and who you see having a closeness and a relationship with for decades to come, then maybe the call is to go ahead and invite those two or three families and not extend an invite to the rest. It's really up to you and I don't have a magical wand that can wave and say that no one's feelings are going to be hurt, or no one's going to be ticked off that they weren't invited, or no one's, you know, going to be upset about it. I I don't know. Unfortunately, feelings get hurt at multiple points along the journey of planning your wedding. We'll review that pretty much every week in one way or another. And to share with you another perspective that kind of illustrates the same point, I was just talking about this with a really close friend of mine, and they, her and her now husband, they live in a huge community, like we're talking hundreds of people who are super close socially. So there's always a party, there's always a progressive dinner, there's always a happy hour, there's always a birthday party that literally everyone is invited to. And when it came to making a guest list for their wedding, they were faced with, we're literally going to have to invite 150 of these people or none of these people. And they chose to invite none of the people because they couldn't pinpoint anyone who had been instrumental in friendship or above and beyond. And it's just easier to say, we're going to keep it really tight. We're inviting our best friends, our childhood friends, our relatives, and that's it. If we invite five sets of friends, then we're kind of pulling the string or the yarn of the sweater and having it all unravel. Do you know what metaphor I'm trying to illustrate there. (laughs) If you invite five, then all of a sudden you need to invite four dozen. So to bring that all full circle and summarize in a couple of quick points, sit with it for a few days, talk about it with your fiance. And if the two of you come around again to that nagging feeling in your heart that no, we really, really want these few people there, then extend an invitation and be honest with the rest. And that's really all you can do. And if you sit with it for a few days, and you think, you know what, I think we're going to be okay just sticking with our closest friends and family, then that's fine too. Okay, let's switch gears into a new question. Are we obligated to provide our vendors a meal and include them in the final headcount for our catering? And the answer, which you're not going to love is maybe. Some vendor contracts will actually stipulate that you are obligated to provide a meal for that vendor. So go through your contract and see if that is or is not the case. It varies by area. It varies by vendor. This is definitely not like a universal blanket yes or no question. I think where I have a little bit of a struggle with this issue at hand is if I personally showed up for a job, I would never expect that my employer was going to serve me a $100 plate of food. If I had a 10 hour job to work, I would show up equipped with my own food. That's just me. And this is one of those weird wedding world etiquette things that I just personally think is really strange and silly, and a little senseless. So it is what it is. Look at your contract. If the contract says you have to, then you have to. If the contract doesn't mention it at all, then you can, you know, talk that over with your vendors and hammer something out. You could also do like a middle ground where you're not serving a $100 plate of food and including them in that headcount. And instead, you're 
offering a side room where there's a sandwich buffet and chips and drinks and whatnot, where people can duck in for, you know, 20 minutes here and there and relax. I'm in no way implying that a wedding photographer would show up for 14 hours of your wedding day and never eat or never drink or never take a break. That would be insane. (laughs) Obviously, there's going to be downtime. I'm just saying I'm not really sure why it falls upon you as the quote employer to provide the $100 plate of food to the employee. Okay, next question and a totally different topic is bachelorette party related. And this listener wonders where my sister had her bachelorette party. And I talked about that extensively in the bachelorette party episode back on December 13th of 2023. And the answer, drum roll please, is that we went and stayed at Hyatt Ziva in Los Cabos. And we had upgraded dining and drinks package, which was amazing. We had completely seamless ground transportation back and forth to and from the airport, which was amazing. And everything was coordinated and planned by Susan from Susan's Travel Services. And Susan is excited to partner with you to plan your bachelor bachelorette party, your honeymoon, or maybe even your destination wedding. Susan and her team have been planning dream vacations for 27 years, and they are truly the best in the business for start to finish planning services. Travel and new experiences are incredibly special to me, and Susan and her team have helped me plan some unforgettable vacations with my friends and my family, and I recommend her to literally everyone I talk to about travel, and that is exactly why I share her amazing planning services with you each and every week. Susan's professional assistance in choosing a location, resort, extra activities, and ground transportation is literally priceless. And best of all, Susan has been doing this for 28 years, and she personally travels to all of her recommended destinations all the time. So she has been to that resort, she has experienced the customer service, she has sat by the pool and ordered drinks, And she has firsthand experience to share with you about all of the amazing resorts, excursions, and services that she recommends. You can reach out to Susan and her team today by emailing info at susanstravelservices.com. And when you get in touch with her, let her know that I sent you and you'll get $50 off your final booking or $200 off your destination wedding. Her email one more time is info at susanstravelservices.com. And of course, I will also put a link to that in today's show notes. A really common stress point that runs through so many of your questions is time, mainly being that there's not enough of it. I can relate. And this new year, wouldn't you love to take the time and stress out of meal planning? With Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery Service, you can skip the grocery store, skip the meal prep, and the cleanup with chef crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door. What should I have for lunch is literally a question that consumes about an hour of most of my days. And with Factor, it's totally solved. Their two minute meals are my secret weapon this new year. And you can try for yourself when you visit factormeals.com slash wedding five zero and use code wedding five zero to get 50% off. I strive to eat a high protein, low carb diet, but taking the time to find creative and delicious meal options is not always an option for me. So I can get into a rut of eating the same thing every single day and forget overpriced, unhealthy and time consuming takeout. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful and healthy meals that fit my health goals. I really think you're going to love this priceless service. And by supporting our valued sponsor, Factor, you are also supporting your favorite wedding planning podcast, for which I am incredibly grateful. Head to factormeals.com slash wedding five zero 
and use code WEDDING50 to get 50% off. That's code WEDDING50 at factormeals.com slash WEDDING50 to get 50% off. This is a fun question about food truck wedding logistics. We love this idea but feel unclear about the best way to approach the setup to make sure that our guests have a smooth experience. I really, really love the idea of incorporating food trucks into your wedding celebration or maybe even your rehearsal dinner, a welcome party, an engagement party. This is just such a really creative way to incorporate vastly different cuisines, flavors, and service styles than a traditional caterer might offer. I do kind of feel going into this question like we could do a full episode just on this topic, but here are some of my notes and bullet points. Quick personal story, one of my husband and I's favorite shows ever is Great Food Truck Race on the Food Network channel, I believe. And we will come back to this show. It is an easy watch. It's great brainless television for the end of your day when you're looking to wind down and get ready for bed. Love, love, love that show. And as we explore the option of having food trucks at your wedding celebration, your rehearsal dinner, or any other event, I think there are two really important places to start and questions to ask yourselves. And number one is how many guests are you looking to host? That's a huge consideration. And number two, what's the experience of the food truck? Serving a line of five to 10 to 15 people over a lunch break is a very, very different situation than having 200 wedding guests coming into your food truck circle at one time. So you're going to want to research trucks who hopefully have some kind of catering experience. And again, they're not just cooking, you know, the one off plate of tacos, but they are equipped and ready to handle and have the experience to handle a much larger group at one time. As for the cost of food trucks, which was also buried within this question, I'm going to give you a really, really solid walkthrough example and also a formula for researching trucks in your area. So the food truck example that I'm going to share with you back to the great food truck race is called the Lime Truck. They are located here in Southern California in Orange County. And the Lime Truck won the Great Food Truck Race in 2011, I believe. They were named in the top five food trucks in America. They took the award for Best Restaurant in Orange County for a food truck to get named the Best Overall Restaurant in a County. That is a very honorable award. They also were named Best Food Truck in Los Angeles And to top it all off, they won the Great Food Truck Race All-Stars again in 2021. So this is not some rinky-dink food truck that's sitting on the busy corner that looks like it's never going to actually start up and be able to drive. We are talking about a food truck with numbers of accolades, super, super popular. So to give you an idea of what this would cost and what the setup would look like. I'm going to read you off their website from the weddings tab and actually just read you what their options are. And if you want to check this out for yourself, if you are located in Southern California, you can visit the lime and I'll put that link in the show notes as well. So their options for weddings, you are welcome to do a la carte. In this setup, your guests would walk up to the truck, they would order whatever they want, and the truck would keep a running tally of your bill, and that's what you would owe at the end. They also have it really nicely packaged for a wedding celebration, and they have a couple different options, which I'm going to walk you through here. So option number one is taste the truck package. And in this option, each of your guests gets unlimited selections from the truck. And per person, this is going to cost you $36. That, my friend, is some pretty affordable catering for a wedding. If you've been out there looking around and getting prices, that's pretty hard to beat. 
The second option below that is called a signature taste the truck package. And in this one, each guest gets one trip to the truck and can choose from a more set selection of options. And per person, that's $22. I'm not going to go through every single thing here, but that's just to give you an idea. We're talking unlimited, delicious, award-winning food from this food truck for $36 per guest. Again, that's pretty hard to beat. You set up some tubs full of ice and canned cocktails, beer, your favorite wine. If you're having a casual outdoor celebration, this gets my vote. This is a no-brainer. Now, of course, if you're doing a more formal sit-down meal setup inside a venue, this is not going to be an option, but it could be an option for your rehearsal dinner, for a welcome party, or even for like a post wedding day send off like a post brunch, they do have a breakfast menu as well. If you're not in Southern California, the lime truck is not going to be a great option for you. I don't think they are willing to drive cross country. It could be wrong. You could always reach out and see. And if that's the case, here's a simple little formula for going out on your own and researching food trucks in your area. So first step, reach out to trucks and ask about their catering experience and their pricing options. This could be a la carte where everyone orders whatever they want and you just tally up the bill or are they willing to work with you on a per person fee as in the example I just gave a minute ago. And then second question to ask is how many people are they comfortable serving? Do not push the limit with this. If they say they are only equipped to handle 50 people within two hours, do not try to, you know, beat the system and have them come to your 150 person wedding. It's going to be a disaster. It's going to result in a really crummy experience for everyone involved. So please honor their estimations of how many people they can serve to do everyone a favor. And then third point is consider branching out and inviting two to three different trucks onto your wedding celebration. You can offer variety this way. You could have one truck that's focusing more on like an appetizer theme. You could have one truck for a main meal and then another truck for a dessert. Be creative. The sky's the limit. This is, again, a really, really fun option and a really good way for you guys to get creative and kind of break out of the box of normal wedding catering. And then finally, my last piece of advice here is really take the time to look at reviews online, whether this is Google reviews, Yelp reviews, whatever platform you use, and also be sure to check out their social media so that you can get a feel for what others have to say who have experienced that food truck, the service, and the food. And to wrap it up for today, I am going to paraphrase this question heavily. A bride is feeling ambushed by her fiance's family. She wants small and intimate, but every event gets blown up and magnified out of control. I feel shy, anxious, and uncomfortable in large crowds of people and would much prefer a quieter small group setting. How can I manage these feelings through the next few months and especially through our wedding itself? Future in-law alert, this is not an easy one. And you mention managing these feelings through the wedding, but you need to consider way beyond the wedding. Because when you marry someone, you are also gaining their family in your lives for better or for worse forever. So incorporating your new family into your lives is going to be a pretty significant thing to manage. And whether you like it or not, you got to do it. You've got to face this because after the wedding is over, these large family events aren't just going to disappear. Now, I don't know the situation specifically in terms of where everyone lives within this family or these two families. But for example, if you are all in the same area, the same city or, you know, relatively close, you're going to be looking at parties and celebrations throughout the year. This is not just a wedding specific problem. You're going to be invited to barbecues, birthday parties, Mother's and Father's Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, on and on and on. 
So bringing the focus back to your question specifically about managing your feelings surrounding wedding events getting blown up. If we're talking about your future mother-in-law hijacking your bridal shower from an intimate 12 person event to a 100 person party, then that is absolutely not fair. And that is going to warrant a very thoughtful, sensitive, and honest conversation, whether that conversation is just you and her, or whether that takes place via your fiance, or however you want to do it. But sweeping stuff like this under the rug is not going to work long term. This definitely falls right back into that category, that pesky little category of difficult conversations and things that aren't really fun about wedding planning. But again, this is something that is not just specific to the wedding or the months leading up to the wedding. This is something that you're going to need to find a way to deal with long term for the next you know, foreseeable future as long as you're married to this person, which I hope is forever. So you've got to communicate and that would probably start with a conversation with your fiance and just bounce some ideas off of them and see what their reaction is. And then talk about how you can move forward together and create a unified plan and really start to work on building a foundation of a relationship with that family and that extended family. Because again, they are now your family as well. I am personally not in love with humongous events and having 50 different conversations in one night, I can completely relate because given the choice, I would much prefer to sit down with four to six of my closest friends than be at a party with a 100 friends. Uh, But again, these are just kind of things that come along with the overall package of planning a wedding, of having multiple families involved, multiple personalities involved, Know that you're not alone. You're not the only one who feels this way. And it's definitely not easy, like I mentioned. So I hope that's helpful. I hope that makes you feel a little bit better about the situation. And thank you again so much to everyone who was in touch for this week's Q&A episode. I will continue to do these. I love to do these. I want to hear what's on your mind and exactly what you're wanting help with. So if you have questions or you have issues that you would like my take on, you are welcome to reach out. Visit the website weddingplanningpodcast.co slash contact and you're free to leave me a voicemail or send me an old-fashioned email. Either way is fine. Thank you again for being here. Your support of the podcast really, really means a lot to me. And we'll meet again next week, same time, same place. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of the Wedding Planning Podcast. For episode recaps and special offers, visit our website at wedpodcast.com. There you'll also find a link to submit your wedding questions and future show topic requests. Follow us wherever you listen for new episodes every Wednesday. And if you're loving the podcast, please leave a five-star rating and review to share your favorite episodes and thoughts with other couples. Wishing you a happy engagement. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of it. And we'll talk again next week, same time, same place.